Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, before the questioning resumes, can I just first of all confirm with you how we intend to proceed today? Um, my understanding is that we'll begin with questioning from Mr. Henry, which, which, which will last for up to one hour. And then after that questioning, there'll be a, the first morning break. Yes. Followed by Mr. Steen, again with questioning up to one hour, <clears throat> followed by the second morning break. And then this morning session will conclude with questioning on behalf of the NFSP and on behalf of a lady called Susan Sinclair. That's right, sir. Then we take our lunch. Uh, then Mr. Maloney will ask questions for up to one hour, and then if she wishes to do so, Ms. Leek may ask questions on behalf of Ms. Venner, and that will then conclude, subject to you, as always, having the last word if necessary. Thank you, sir. Right, so that deals with the timetable for today. And then, um, just so, to avoid any confusion, if there is any, about um, what is to be said about Ms. McLeod. Can I make it clear that um, there will be, if there is not already, a reasonably lengthy statement on the inquiry website? I don't propose to, in effect, read it out today. Uh, that would take up unnecessary time. Uh, but my reasoning uh, is fully set out uh, in the written statement as to how it comes to be that Ms. McLeod will not give oral evidence. Thank you very right. much, sir. And just for the record for our transcript, uh, because we're, uh, as people will see when they read your statement, reading her statement into the record. Yes. Uh, her witness statements, URN, is WITN 1001-0100. So that is, by virtue of what I've just done, to be treated as uh, evidence in the inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Beer. All right, over, over to you, Mr. Henry. And um, since I've taken two or three minutes of your time, would you aim to complete your questioning, please, by um, 10.50? Thank you, sir. There were so many forks in the road, but you always took the wrong path, didn't you? It was an extraordinarily complex undertaking and the post office and I didn't always take the right path. I'm very clear about that. You exercise power with no thought of the consequences of your actions, despite those consequences staring you in the face. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Could you say... You exercise power with no thought of the consequences of your actions, despite those consequences staring you in the face. The scheme was set up, and for the time that I worked on that, I believed that I, and I wasn't working alone in this, I was surrounded by colleagues, as the inquiry has seen, and I believed that we were doing the right things, and clearly that was not always the case. We Can did, I take you if, to... If I may... Um, we did look at the consequences, and although that may have been misunderstood, the reason I circulated the eight cases, uh, including Mr. Castleton's, was that I was, it was an act of compassion, and I was very moved by the content of that. That was right at the start of the mediation process, and I felt it was important that I and colleagues understood that. But I accept your point, that there are no words I can find today that will make the sorrow and what people have gone through any better. Miss Fennells, that's humbug. You preach compassion, but you don't practice it. For example, with Mr Castleton, he was even closed out of the mediation process. And you know why that was, don't you? I'm sorry, I, I cannot recall the detail of that. I'm not, I wasn't personally involved in which cases did or didn't go into the mediation scheme. It so deeply moved you, you said in your statement, it was so shocking, yet 
he was locked out of the mediation scheme because, of course, he was an illustrious scalp that could be used, a precedent that could be used in the GLO. What happened to Mr Carlson is completely unacceptable. At the time his case was not taken through the scheme, the post, I personally wasn't involved in the decision, but the post office took the decision based on legal advice. Yes. It was wrong, Mr Henry. I completely agree with that. And what happened to Mr Carlson is, is, is unforgivable. And you instigated no investigation into why £321,000 of public money was used to crush him and grind him into the dirt. I'm, I agree with what you're saying. Thank you. Um, let's, I'm talking now about things that were staring you in the face. Um, no need to get it up on screen, but you remember, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with talking to your husband. I don't suggest that you should be ashamed at all about that. But you wrote that email, my engineer, computer literate husband, sent the following reply to the question, what is a non-emotive word for computer bugs, glitches, defects that happen as a matter of course? Answer, exception or anomaly. You can also say conditional exception anomaly, which only manifests itself under unforeseen circumstances. Unforeseen, random, difficult to predict, impossible to guard against. It was staring you in the face, but you took from your husband's text or email that which suited you and ignored or dismissed the potent jeopardy that these bugs could arise under unforeseen circumstances. Isn't that shocking? I covered this yesterday with Mr Beer. I should have said bugs. The post office should have said I'm bugs. not talking about that. I'm talking about manifests itself under unforeseen circumstances. In other words, these things could crop up intermittently at any time, as Tim McCormack warned you in 2014. And here you have this from your husband uh, on the 2nd of July, 2013 warning you about bugs that manifest themselves under unforeseen circumstances. You should have been horrified. I was concerned by the bugs. There was... A, you did nothing. Well, Mr Henry, let her finish, please. So be it, sir. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? You were concerned by the bugs, you say. What I'm suggesting to you is that you took what you wanted from the information your husband had supplied to you, but you did not heed the warning contained in what he said, which was that these bugs could manifest themselves under unforeseen circumstances. It was staring you in the face. The inquiry has heard that there was information that was not known to me and potentially to other colleagues I was working alongside. At that stage, I only had the information of those two bugs. There were, as I said in my statement, other glitches and incidents that, that I had come across visiting post offices. Uh, what, what I've said on, on this so far is, is all that I knew at the time and really all, all that I can say is, and I repeat again, we should have said bugs. You have no one to blame but yourself. Do you agree? Where I'm, absolutely. Where I made mistakes and I made the wrong calls, whether or not I had, in, in those cases where I didn't have information, I think that's more difficult. But well, where I had information and I made the wrong calls, yes, of course. You are responsible for your own downfall, aren't you? I, from when the Court of Appeal passed its judgment, I lost all the employment that I have had. And since that time, I have only worked on this inquiry. 
it has been really important to me to do what I didn't or was unable to do at the time I was chief executive. And I have worked for the last three years and prioritized this above anything else. For the last year, it has probably been a full-time job. And it is my commitment. I have avoided talking to the press, perhaps to my own detriment, because all the way through, I have put this first. I suggest to you that you still continue to live in a cloud of denial, and it persists even to today, because you have given, in 750-odd pages, a craven, self-serving account, haven't you? I didn't know. Nobody told me. I can't remember. I wasn't shown this. I relied on the lawyers. I have tried to do this to the very best of my ability. I have taken, as I hope the inquiry has seen, all of the questions I've been asked. I have answered them honestly, no matter how difficult or how embarrassing or how wrong I was at the time. I don't believe I could have worked harder for this. What I'm going to suggest to you is that whatever you did was deliberate, considered, and calculated. No one deceived you. No one misled you. You set the agenda and the tone for the business. I'm sorry, what's, what's the question? You set the agenda and the tone for the business didn't you? I was the chief executive. I did not set the agenda for the work of the scheme and the way the legal and the IT parts of it worked. I wasn't, as I've said to, to the inquiry the last two days, I'm not a lawyer. I didn't have the expertise or the experience to lead on that, nor did I on the IT side. I had to rely on those colleagues who were experts and I had no reason not to take the advice that I was given. I accept I was chief executive, and as, as, as I have said, as a chief executive, you have ultimate accountability, and, and that is simply fact. You are not responsible for everything that happens underneath you. You have to rely on the advice of internal and external experts, and that is what I did, and I was not working alone on this. I was surrounded by a board, by a group executive committee. I cannot think that any of the major decisions I took by myself in isolation of anybody, this was far too serious an undertaking for the post office, for everybody affected, for every single postmaster case. And my ambition was to get those through the scheme. I did my very best through this, and it wasn't good enough. And that is a regret I carry with me. Now, what, I mean, you like euphemisms like anomaly or exception. So I'm going to use a euphemism called containment. You wanted to contain this problem. Sounds so much nicer than suppression, doesn't it? You wanted to contain this escalating threat to your leadership and the image that you wanted to project to stakeholders, the board, the government, Whitehall, and the media? That isn't the way I worked. You were managing up, not down. You're very politically adept, aren't you? My role required me to work with various groups of stakeholders, inside and outside the organization, upwards and downwards from my role. And I tried my very best to work with all of those groups at whatever level they worked in the organization or outside of it. Do you agree that you're politically adept? I would suggest that wasn't the case. There were people in the organization who had, this was my first job in a public sector organization. I had no experience prior to this of working alongside um, politicians or, or the civil service. Well, your your denial is surprising. I, your denial is surprising. Henry, please, please. Sorry, sir, uh, I do apologize. I, I appreciate that um, 
you have a difficult task, but also the witness has a difficult task. So I'd ask you both, one to ask the question, one to complete the answer, and then we move on. I do apologise to the witness, sir, and I also apologise to you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've answered your question. I mean, it's surprising your refusal to admit your political skills, because you ended up in the Cabinet Office, didn't you? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the connection. Well, your concerns were managing upwards. You were obsessed with the media, pleasing the stakeholders, the board, the government, Whitehall. Those were your priorities, weren't they? They were very important stakeholders for the post office board. The post office, as, as you know, was owned. It had its single shareholder was government. That was an important part of my role. It most certainly wasn't um, the largest part of my role by any means. Hmm. I'm going to go now to 2010, and the top policy goal of your 100% shareholder, the government, was to split the post office from Royal Mail and then privatise Royal Mail by floating it on the stock market. You agree? That was a, an important priority for government, yes. And helping to fulfil that plan was therefore important to you uh, because, of course, you'd be measured upon it as a yardstick of your success at Royal Mail and then subsequently the post office. It was probably more significant for Royal Mail than it was the post office as challenge was trying to cope with the separation to make it happen. And um, you worked closely with Dave Smith, didn't you? The managing director? Mm-hmm. Yes, he was my boss. Yes. And he commissioned the Ismay report, which you must have read at the time. I, I don't believe I did. And oh. I have found no... Do, the, the document itself, when I saw it recently in preparation for the inquiry, seemed to be a surprise to me. And I, don't, I haven't seen any documentation to say that I received it. Yes. Uh, not aware of the Ismay report, you say? I don't think so, no. Yeah. Uh, Horizon had a clean bill of health. Its integrity was sound, but I digress. Obviously, the proposed flotation of the Royal Mail Group was vitally important to Donald Bryden and Moya Green as well. Uh, I, I'm sure it was, but you'd yeah. have to ask them. Yeah. Back in 2010, a week before you were appointed managing director, a trial took place in Guildford and an innocent woman was jailed. Her trial became the high watermark of Horizon infallibility. Her conviction became, for years, a validation of Horizon's integrity for the post office. It was, as it were, a test case. And if the post office had failed in this prosecution, it would have opened up the floodgates to civil litigation, civil claims for damages, and a defeat in that trial in Guildford would have made civil claims difficult to defend. The inquiry has seen documents to support what I've just put to you. Um, but do I take it you knew nothing about that case at the time, in October 2010, because you were unaware of prosecutions being mounted by the post office until 2012? My... my I, I've seen some documentation this morning that showed... I was aware of the case afterwards. I think, I can't remember, I'm sorry, if, um, in my statement, but I think I say in my statement that I remember being told about the case after the court had reached its decision. And so that would have been at the time of the, of that, of the conviction. Hmm. You see, uh, again, no need to put it up, but there's an email chain which you've seen this morning, dated the 21st of October 2010, to Rod Ismay, Mike Moores, Mike Moores, Chief Finance Officer? Yes. Mike Young, Head of IT? Yes. And you, from Dave Smith, after hearing that Seema Misra had been jailed, saying, brilliant news, well done, please pass on my thanks to the team. And then Mr Ismay forwards that 
to uh, a wider group of people, including Susan Crichton, um, and with these words. Dave and the executive team have been aware of the significance of these challenges and have been supportive of the excellent work going on in so many teams to justify the confidence that we have in Horizon and in our supporting processes. So you must have been aware at the time, because you were, of course, a member of the executive team. I was. Um, I, I can't recall the executive team discussing Mrs. Misra's case or any other cases. They, as far as I can see from documentation of my recall, they didn't come to the executive committee in any detail. Mm. I, uh, well, let's move on. So you don't know about the Ismay report? I don't believe I did, no. Right. It's 26th of November 2010. There's an email to you, Mike Moores, <laughs> Chief Finance, Mike Young, Head of IT, Susan Crichton, Kevin Gilliland, Sue Huggins, and Rod Ismay. And um, if you want to see it, but I think you've already seen it outside of the room, but it's uh, POL 00120561. And the subject line is update on JFSA and horizon issues and urgent response needed for BIS in strictest confidence. Uh, and it reads as follows. You will be aware of the allegations that the JFSA have been making about the integrity of Horizon, the integrity of the system and the associated processes that Poll uses in terminating contracts. There have also been various legal cases relating to individual sub-postmasters being prosecuted for theft, false accounting. Uh, Mrs. Misra uh, is then mentioned, uh, the most recent being Ms. Misra where the ex-sub-postmaster was recently found guilty of theft. As you are aware, Channel 4 were also looking at the subject in the summer, although nothing yet has come of this. Our approach throughout has been to robustly defend the integrity of the Horizon system. And then it talks about positioning because it's very important that BIS don't do something off their own bat which could lead to more difficulties. And then these words, as you have all had an involvement in this particular issue, I'm looking to see if I can gain concurrence to this particular statement, which was a very robust statement about Horizon's integrity. Now, as you have all had an involvement in this particular issue, and that issue, of course, is Horizon issues, and Rod Ismay is on the same uh, email as you, that email um, sent to you, Mike Moores, Mike Young. Are you sure that you hadn't discussed with Rod Ismay anything to do with his report? No, uh, I don't believe I had, Mr. Henry. Right. Anyway, we know that on the 13th of June 2011, the Postal Services Act um, was passed that set down the roadmap for the separation um, and the privatization. Uh, you agree with that? Yes. And then on the 29th of September 2011, three months after the act, you received the email from Mr. Bryden, chair of RMG, which Mr. Beer took you to yesterday. Um, and that was, of course, the private eye uh, article and he was expressing concerns and giving you, Alice, and you and Alice Perkins directions about how to deal with the sub-postmaster's complaints, wasn't he? Uh, yes, I can't remember the email in detail. Yes. Um, he was saying that the article raises some questions about Horizon. Uh, I suspect the Audit and Risk Committee ought to take an interest. Have we ever had an independent audit of Horizon? Question mark. And he was worried that this might disrupt the big plan to privatise the Royal Mail Group, wasn't he? I'm sorry, I don't recollect that. I, I, whether I made that association, I don't know. Well, if it were to be established that the Royal Mail Group had wrongly prosecuted 
dozens, hundreds of sub-postmasters who might sue them. It would have threatened to disrupt the flotation in October 2013, wouldn't it? I'm sure that would have been the case. Yeah. And you have accepted in your witness statement that attempts to reopen past prosecutions posed a reputational and financial risk to the post office. I, would you mind taking me to that, if you want? Well, I, by, I, by all I, means, it's, it's paragraph 456. Thank you. So if we could um, go to uh, your first witness statement, uh, WITN 01020100. And uh, it's paragraph 456. I'm so sorry, I seem to have lost the page reference for it, but. Um, it's page 220. Th thank you so much, sir. Martin Edwards. <coughs> Correct? Right, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, this would also pose a reputational financial risk to the Royal, Royal Mail Group uh, since they were responsible for the legacy of prosecutions because until 2012 they were the prosecuting authority, weren't they? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and no need to go to your reply to Mr. Bryden, but. Uh, Mr. Beer took you to it. To use his expression, Poll has a 100% strike rate in court. Um, but Poll was, the post office was going to have Horizon verified by an external systems auditor uh, with results in the next month. Um, you say you don't remember, but this clearly, this reference to an external systems auditor, this was clearly a reference to the work that Ernst and Young had recommended in their. 2011 audit letter, wasn't it? No, I don't believe it was, and the inquiry has documentation that refers to two separate external agencies. One was a company called Pentest, I think, and the other was KPMG, and I haven't been able to find, I hadn't recalled that, um, and I chased Leslie Sewell or Mike Young for progress on that work. Uh, and I haven't seen anything uh, that followed it through. Okay. Well, let's concentrate, however, on the Ernst & Young angle for a moment, because you will accept that they recommended what it was then called an SAS 70 audit. Do you remember that? I'm sorry. That, sorry could you say that again, please? You do remember that Ernst & Young had recommended... Uh, as a solution to what Mr. Beer had called remote access one, was an SAS 70 audit. Yes, I do. Yes. Um, and that that would, um, as it were, try to address the threat that they had identified, which was that lax controls at Fujitsu, and I quote, may lead to the processing of erroneous or unauthorised transactions. You do, you do remember that? I do. It wasn't exactly that, that the SS70, there was a new name for it after that, was to, that the issue that, that Ernst & Young said in their management letter that they had had to put in, and these are my words, not theirs, but something like manual workarounds to reach the conclusion they had that they could pass an unqualified audit. They said that it would have been much easier if Fujitsu had in place a SAS 70, which was a, I, my understanding was an ongoing and automated uh, reporting on the various controls in place. And by the time we got to 2012-13, that had been introduced. It had taken some work with Fujitsu to get there. We know that Leslie Sewell rather than getting an SAS 70 audit, asked the Royal Mail Group for an internal audit. Were you responsible 
for I that. Beg your pardon. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Were you responsible for that? There were, uh, I, if I may, I, having read through the documentation and, and remembered on this, I think the process is slightly different than you outline. So there was criticism in 1011 because the audit had taken too long. It had run over massively in terms of time and budget, and the reason for, there were two reasons for that. Ernst & Young had a new team on it and didn't, and were not familiar. And secondly, Horizon Online had been put in place, and there simply hadn't been, I'm told, there simply hadn't been the time to get all of the right controls and documentation up to speed. So Ernst & Young had to spend much more time to validate what was there. They suggested a SAS 70 report. We then worked with Fujitsu to make sure that that was put in place. They were not keen to do it because it was a huge investment for them, but they agreed to do that. And then through one of the check steps in that process for improving the approach to the audit was the Royal Mail internal audit process. Um, that was not instead of, that was a check step to make sure that Leslie Sewell and her team were an independent check step, independence and in inverted commas, but internal audit teams are generally seen as independent as much as they can be within a company. Um, and that was a check step to make sure that Leslie and her team were doing the work that was required to achieve what eventually became ISAE 2304, I think, or 2403. Well, the internal audit review of Horizon has been seen by the inquiry, and I, I, it's, it's dated the 1st of uh, February 2012. It was sent to you and to Moya Green, the CEO at RMG, yes. as well as to other senior people at RMG. And it stated that with regard to the poor controls, it found that it is, and I quote, it is difficult to detect and prevent inappropriate changes being made to master data. Uh, and it, it also responded to the Ernst & Young March 2011 letter. <coughs> and stated that the position as at the end of January 2012 was that none of the issues raised by Ernst & Young had been resolved. The verdicts were that substantial progress had been made in some, in, uh, substantial progress had been made in respect of some of the recommendations or significant work remained and was required. So I just ask you this, um, would it be right to say that that remained the position throughout the time that you were CEO? You were MD from October but, um, 2010, but uh, CEO in 2012. Those issues were never fully resolved, were they? You, well, you, you're right to raise that report because what it did was... It was a very useful report because what it did was highlight... First of all, and of course, people took reassurance from that, the areas where progress had been made, uh, and it highlighted where further work was needed. From memory, I think substantial progress had been made on... The, there were 10 recommendations in the Ernst & Young report. Four of those were high-risk... Uh, high no, not high-risk, high-rating. And I believe the Royal Mail Internal Audit Report said that was where substantial progress had been made. There was still more progress to be made. In 12-13, so the end of the following financial year, when I was chief executive, and throughout the year prior to that, there had been numbers of check steps in place. Ernst & Young found that, um, again, forgive me, because I can't remember the words from the report, but they were very pleased with the outcome. The audit had gone very well. And there were always, as there always are in these processes, some improvements to be made. But Leslie was congratulated on the work that was done. The chair of the Post Office Audit Committee congratulated her on that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I and the group executive and the board took some comfort from that. As we went forwards, the audits continued to flag some improvements, but to, to be clear that the accounts could be signed off unqualified and that the IT side of the audits um, had improved from the, I think, you know, you, you're right to flag the crisis situation, which, which we took over on, on separation. I, I'm sure 
that the board took comfort. I'm sure there was a mutual congratulatory fest. Um, but the fact is, remote access was never unauthorized tampering, was never resolved throughout the entire time of your tenure as managing director and as chief executive. And, and, and the question is? Well, in other words, the disconnect between corporate communications, the outward face of the business, and the grubby internal reality. I, I'm sorry, I'm still, I, I'm really not, I want to be able to help. I'm, uh, you're well, making let, let me try, Ms. Bellows. I think the point that's being put to you is that throughout the period that you were chief executive, let, let's keep to that, uh, makes it simpler, the true extent of remote access was never satisfactorily resolved by the senior people at the post office. Uh, uh, and th th so when that is correct, the, right. the, the, the volume of interventions that were happening, uh, as I understand it, and, and I can only, I've only understood this since in terms of what is detailed in the Horizon IT judgment and the, the Project Bramble report, which I've seen afterwards, is it appears as though there were interventions on a, on a fairly frequent basis, um, which, as Mr. Beer said yesterday, was not uncovered, um, at least, I'm sorry, was, was not known to me, and I believe the board and the group executive. I don't know how widely within post office that information was known, but clearly it was happening. It is extraordinary, though, isn't it? Because Cartwright King, your external lawyers, know all about it, uh, and yet um, you're saying that you didn't, the board didn't. I mean, this is la-la land, isn't it? What, what was the, the point about Cartwright King, please? Well, Cartwright King were concerned about remote access and um, Andy Wynn having to um, authorise transactions, and Cartwright King were stating uh, that, you know, they, they weren't sure how, to what extent the post office actually knew about Fujitsu's access to the system. Uh, that, I think, I'm not sure if that's news to me or not um, today. I, I don't recall that at all from the time. If our external lawyers were aware of that, and that was shared within the post office, it is completely unacceptable. I had no knowledge that Cartwright King knew that at the time I was chief executive. Well, anyway, I'm going to now fast forward to July 2013. July 2013, of course, is a momentous month because, of course, there's going to be the announcement on the privatization on the 10th of July, correct? It's also the month, of course, that Second Sight presents its interim report, which was a bit of a bombshell, correct? Yes, You're, sorry, yes. 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 And, of course, it's also the month, although the groundwork for it had been laid the month before, where the unsafe witness emerges into clear sight. Gareth Jenkins fatally undermined and having put the post office in breach of its duties as a prosecutor. So it's a very, very momentous month. Um, and of course, you were at the centre of all of that, weren't you? I was aware of some of that. Hmm. Let's go to POL 00111. So one 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 six two five. Mm -hmm. 
I don't see it up on my... Oh, no, no, I do. Thank you. So this is the internal briefing note to you, and presumably it's after you've received your uh, text or email from your husband uh, because of the nomenclature that's used in this. Um, but could we go to paragraph 8, please, which is on page uh, 2? In other words, the next page. Paragraph 8, please. We believe James R. Buthnot may feel that any interim findings which disclose any issue with Horizon should result in past criminal prosecutions by the Post Office Limited being reopened and overturned. So that is noted. Could we now go to paragraph 30, please? The Falkirk anomaly was the subject of expert evidence in the Misra criminal prosecution where the defence expert asserted that its existence demonstrated Horizon had faults which could cause losses and therefore that possibility, the possibility could not be excluded in Misra's case. The prosecution expert Gareth Jenkins from Fujitsu, etc., etc. So you knew because you would have read this briefing and you would have read it very carefully given the fact that it refers to anomalies and the like, uh, which was done at your instigation, presumably. You would have been aware that Gareth Jenkins was the prosecution expert in Mrs. Misra's trial, correct? Uh, I would think so, yes. Well, I mean... Not, I would think so. I mean, there it is. It's a briefing to you. I'm sorry. Yes, of course. I, 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 what I meant by my response was how much of this very detailed briefing I'd taken in on board at the time, but it's absolutely there. You're, you're correct. It's the job of a CEO to read briefings and take them on board, isn't it? Yes, it is. Right. Now, while all of this is... Um, going on. Um, the inquiry has got documents, and you have been shown them, I'm sure, and I don't go against it, parliamentary privilege in any way at all. But on the 9th of July, um, the minister, uh, Jay Swinson, uh, gave a short statement to Parliament, uh, which included, it is important to note that the issues in the report have no impact on Royal Mail, which is an entirely separate business. Uh, and there was also a WIPS briefing that the inquiry has seen, uh, which talks about wide impacts, and it says this, Royal Mail privatisation, the timing of our Buthnot's intended statement should be considered in the context of the Royal Mail privatisation. Vince Cable and Michael Fallon are making a statement to Parliament on Wednesday the 10th of July, setting out the steps towards a Royal Mail transaction. In the eyes of many MPs, the media and the public at large. Royal Mail and Post Office are the same entity, although not related. The adverse coverage that Arbuthnot is seeking to attract is likely to have a significant diversionary impact uh, on the messaging of the Royal Mail uh, statement. Uh, and that should be on record. That's UKGI 0000016. Now, you could see, couldn't you? It must have been obvious to you. It must have been staring you in the face that if you had a blow-up or a conflagration concerning the second site interim report, the prospect of criminal convictions being challenged, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this would be hugely embarrassing politically and potentially damaging to the flotation. I don't believe I was involved in any of those conversations. The privatization, the, the two organizations, with some ex exceptions, um, were now working separately. <coughs> I had no conversations about any strategy around the Royal Mail privatization. But Let's be clear, you 
were given the job, I suggest, or it must have been uppermost in your mind, keep the lid on this. Because, of course, you wanted to please stakeholders. You wanted to please the board, government, Whitehall. I mean, how else can we explain your intransigence throughout your tenure in relation to the concerns that were being brought to you about Horizon? I'm sorry, Mr. Henry. Could you repeat the first half of the question, please? What I'm suggesting to you <laughs> is that you wanted to defuse this because, of course, it was going to be immensely politically damaging both to the post office itself, but also to the privatisation. And you were, of course, anxious to please Biz, weren't you? I had no role at all in relation to the privatisation. I had no conversations with Biz about the privatisation. My concerns at this stage were only about the post office. And as the inquiry has seen, there, there were many, many conversations and a good deal of documentation at this time about how we might find a way through this. I don't believe I made any connection between this and the Royal Mail privatisation at all. And I have... My approach to my work is that I do it to the best of my ability um, and honestly. It was not... I, I don't think it was ever my style to try to please or to keep in with people, um, whoever they were. When you're doing a job as difficult as this was, you make it more complicated if you try to do that. Well, then I'm going to ask you about the 12th of September 2013. The government announces the IPO of shares in the Royal Mail Group. <coughs> And that did open up a problem for the post office, because what was the prospectus going to say about Horizon and Second Sight? And what was it going to say about Gareth Jenkins? You say you had absolutely nothing to do with the privatisation. Why did you get involved in bowdlerizing or amending the prospectus? That this was a very last minute. I wasn't involved in the prospectus at all. I can't remember how it occurred, but it was flagged to me, that within, which was complete news, that within the IT section, and, and I should say this isn't a recollection at all. This is, this is from looking at documentation this morning. Um, it was flagged to me that in the IT section of the Royal Mail prospectus, there was a reference to... I can't remember the words now, but risks related to the Horizon IT system. And again, I, I can't recall, but, but I clearly arrived at a view that that seemed, um, it seemed the wrong place to, so the line that was put in said that uh, no systemic issues had been found with the Horizon system. The Horizon system was no longer anything to do with the Royal Mail Group. So I got in touch with the company secretary and said, this, I don't understand why this is here. Please, can we have it removed? This prospectus is about Royal Mail and then the post office. Um, and I believe that was the case. The other thing I learned from the documentation this morning that I did not know at the time is that the original um, genesis of that statement going into that IT section was from one of the non-executive directors who sat on the Royal Mail Board and the Post Office Board, Les Owen. Now, whether Les Owen had wanted to put that in because in some ways it was reassuring about the Horizon IT system, I don't know. But my, my involvement was simply to say, I don't understand why there is a line in an IT section in a Royal Mail prospectus about the Post Office. And I don't recall, but I believe it was taken out. You had, on the 16th of July, the board meeting where Susan Crichton is sitting outside on the naughty step. You know that at that 16th of July board meeting, the board was alarmed 
about potential claims against it, correct? Yes. You know as well that on the 22nd of July, your insurers were notified, correct? There I was a don't notification. recall that, but I'm happy to take your word. Right. Now, how would revelations about possible prosecution failures during the time when Royal Mail was in charge of the post office have affected privatisation? It would have been devastating, wouldn't it? Yes, it would, I'm sure. Yes. Right, so was this discussed uh, with the Royal Mail Board? I don't know if it was discussed with the Royal Mail Board. It certainly wasn't discussed at the Post Office Board. What about your discussions with the business department? Because you were in regular contact with Biz. Did you discuss it with Biz? No, I don't believe it was discussed with Biz. Right. Not, not by the Post Office. I, sorry, not by me. Whether the chairman... I can't think who else, but I certainly didn't. Well, you, you've mentioned, of course, about Les Owen, because he had formerly been on the inside at the post office, because he had formerly been a board director at the post office, hadn't he? Yes, he had. Right. And he was concerned enough to want something put in the prospectus, but you wanted it taken out, and you succeeded in getting it taken out, didn't you? I did, because I felt it was an irrelevant statement in a, in a section about the Royal Mail IT system. And you sent an email to Alice Perkins, POL 0014-46462, which stated, I have earned my keep on this one. Do you remember reading that this morning? I do, yes. What did you mean when you wrote that to your chairman? I meant that it had taken some, some, some time in a, very, in a very short period of time to um, remove that statement about post office IT from the Royal Mail prospectus because I didn't believe that it was helpful in any way to the post office because the two businesses were separate. The prospectus was about the flotation of the Royal Mail and as I've said a couple of times over the last two days, there was always with the post office, and it was the same for the Royal Mail, um, the, the challenge of managing potential misinterpretation in the media um, of facts that, that were not necessarily always understood. And this, as chief executive, part of your role is to protect the reputation of the post office as it is for the board and the chairman. There would have been no misinterpretation in the media because the media's instincts were entirely correct. You knew of the existence of bugs, errors and defects. And you'd already kept those out, hadn't you? Because they don't appear in the prospectus. I had no work, Mr Henry, on the prospectus at, at all. No involvement with it until this very last minute intervention you knew that there was a risk of civil claims for wrongful prosecutions and civil actions based on such bugs. You were aware of that. 16th of July, board meeting. Correct? Yes, yes. You knew that the Royal Mail Group was responsible for the legacy of those prosecutions together with the post office. You really had earned your keep on that one, hadn't you? You kept the lid on it. That was not at all what I was doing. I had no reflection in relation to that whatsoever. Contain negative press, protect the business, hide horizon issues. That's the truth, isn't it? No, Mr. Henry, that isn't the truth. I, I never, I, as I said earlier, if there were difficult issues that needed to be addressed, that was what I tried to do. Right. Now, Mr. Henry, just before you go on to a slightly different topic, if yeah. it is, um, that line of questioning, as you'll appreciate, is new to me. So I'd be grateful if you or Miss Page would give Mr. Beer a note of the documents you've been referring to so that I can read them for myself. Thank you, sir. We shall do so. Um, the 27th of September 2013, the 
prospectus's release, the closing date for Royal Mail share applications is the 8th of October 2013. Um, and this is around the time, a month after we can know for sure that you had been told about Gareth Jenkins, because you must accept that you've been told about the Gareth Jenkins problem um, at least a month before the 27th of September 2013. I believe that's correct, yes. Right. I, I explained to Mr Beer what I had been told about uh, Gareth Jenkins and the bugs. Yeah. I, I'm just going to concentrate, because... I suggest that um, your conversation with Leslie Sewell um, is um, a creation of yours, isn't it? I'm sorry? Well, you see, you want to explain how you acquired the information about Jenkins, but at the same time being told that it wasn't a serious legal problem. So... You have an undocumented conversation with Miss Sewell uh, in the corridor where she says, oh, it's more of a practical problem, it's all a red herring. Uh, and so that gives you reassurance that it isn't a serious legal problem, as you knew it to be. I've told the inquiry exactly how I found out in the conversation with Leslie Sewell, as, as I explained to Mr Beer. You see, you were fully briefed by the lawyers, weren't you? I, uh, I've, I've spoken to the inquiry about this with Mr Beer. I was briefed by Leslie, as I explained. I came across her in a corridor looking frustrated about something. We had a conversation. She explained that... And I don't believe she dismissed it as an inconvenience, or however you suggested. The question I'm putting to you is that you were fully briefed about this, about risk, by Susan Crichton. What do you say to that? I was briefed by Susan that Gareth Jenkins could no longer be used. I'm not sure what you mean by risk. Uh, that, that, uh, what I know now is much more about this, that Gareth Jenkins hadn't been properly briefed in the first place, as an expert witness, um, and but at the time, that the, I had no idea of the contents of the Simon Clark advice. I want to ask you, please, because I'm going to suggest to you that uh, you must have known about this by the end um, of. Um, August, uh, and I want to take you to POL 008065. And could we um, go to the second page, please? And could we scroll up, please? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yes, right. Legal and adjudication of future case. We are urgently working with our external firms to identify an independent expert to provide evidence on the Horizon system. Previously, this was provided by Fujitsu. Th these are you in caps. Yes, yes. Why move from this? Do we have to validate Fujitsu? Okay. And you sent that to Susan Crichton from memory. I think it was the 23rd of August. She responds um, on the um, 28th, I think, 
And she says this, we are concerned that this needs to be independent rather than Fujitsu verifying its own system. Happy to explain rationale further at our steering board meeting this week. And that took place on the 29th of August, 2013. So, there we have a very careful response from Susan Crichton, not putting down anything in writing, but she must have fully informed you about the problem um, by the steering group uh, meeting on the 29th of August 2013. The, the nature of this response, which, again, I've only seen this morning, but I think I'm fairly clear in my recall on this, is that we were under um, significant pressure, as the inquiry has heard from myself and many others, in terms of cost management. And my question here was based on this, which is, well, surely, if we've had to stand down Mr. Jenkins, I don't know whether I remembered his name or not at this stage, um, why would we not get Fujitsu to provide us another witness, uh, another, um, uh, yes, uh, another witness, um, why would we move from that? Because the cost on that had been borne by Fujitsu. And so my, que my last question is, does this mean, therefore, we can't do that because we have to validate Fujitsu? It was a completely open, straightforward question. And Susan's answer was, uh, we, I'll explain that to you when we meet. I've got very little time left, so I'm going to have to just give you the document references without putting them up. I suggest that this knowledge changed your behaviour because your plan was to have a lessons learned review going into some considerable detail, POL 00146243. And on the 3rd of September 2013, that was run past Bond Dickinson, and you decide to limit the lessons learned review and de-risk it by making it a much smaller in scope and that it should only take place after Susan Crichton has gone. That, I suggest, is because you are already moving into cover-up mode concerning Gareth Jenkins. No, and I'm sorry we haven't got more time to go through that because I read that document this morning. The, there were two issues around less, the lessons learned review. I was looking for, as the inquiry has heard, a very fast review because I was faced with how do we really make this scheme work going forwards? How do we work properly and carefully with Second Sight and the JFSA? And what were the lessons learned in terms of the project management side? That was going to be overseen by the ARC and the Chair of ARC. When I came back off holiday, there was a different process put in place. Um, Susan and Simon Baker were leaving the organization, and part of that review had been to look at how, as I explained yesterday, the project management hadn't been handled as well as it could have been. As they were leaving the organization, the, the, the requirement was for something fairly fast and speedy so we could move forward. At the same time, and I was not aware of this, I guess it must have been Susan, somebody sought advice from Bond Dickinson, who came back with, and I've only seen it this morning, um, a three-page note as to why, from a legal point of view, the review shouldn't be taken forwards. Um, and so th that, was what was, that, that is what was, uh, that is what happened. Andy I... Parsons was telling you that it would blow open duties of proactive disclosure for criminal appeals. It's, it's a very long note, and there is a lot of legal information in it. And I say to the person who forwarded it to me, thank you, I can see what this says. And then I say that I'm going to discuss it with Alwyn. I've seen nothing more, Mr. Henry. But if you are suggesting that I had suddenly changed my approach to things, that was not the case. No, All you the said the timing was helpful that you would follow their advice and that the timing was helpful. And the timing was helpful because you knew about Gareth Jenkins. You knew I've about the unsafe witness and you did nothing to disclose it. Uh, that's not the case. Now, I've got it, one... And, and I think it's really important. That is not the case. I did not know that. If the post office knew it, 
it should have disclosed it, and those advices should have come to the board. What legal knowledge do you need to know, Ms Venels, that if an unsafe witness has given false witness or false evidence against somebody by not telling the whole picture about Horizon's integrity, what legal knowledge did you need to know to say, oh, well, we should tell her lawyers? I understood that we were in the process of disclosing the second site report, and I learned later the Helen Rose report, to the, uh, to, uh, as part of the CK SIFT review. That's separate and distinct from Gareth Jenkins' alleged misconduct and alleged perjury. Mr Henry, I, I've got the point. You've got the point. Can I go to one last document, sir? I'll deal with it very, very quickly. Yeah. On the 23rd of February 2015, there is a document called POL 00116285. And if we could get that up, I would be so grateful. And could we go to the um, 3.4 in the document? This is um, you in contact with uh, your team. Uh, and could we go to 3.4 further down? Yes, thank you. Prosecution paper, Chris Ayard and Mark. And then you write this. If we are likely to take forwards fewer of the stack cases, what is the reason and what is the comms line to explain that? Presumably, this is genuinely a post office view of lessons learnt and or closer to the supportive mutual culture we want in place. If we were to explain it like that, does it then lead to a need for further disclosure regarding past legal cases? Presumably not, as they were subject to the policy at the time. And then Mr. Oyard responds, correct, and double-checked with Brian Altman, QC. Ms. Fennels, the real reason you're not prosecuting stat cases is because you don't have an expert to validate Horizon. You knew that? No, at this date we had stopped prosecutions. Um, Stack cases are the cases yes, waiting they were to the be ones prosecuted. Waiting, yes, and, and, I, um, and I say in the next point actually that I'm uncomfortable keeping people waiting. This will be a big yeah. deal for them and very stressful. What you're doing here, I suggest, is what you have done in other contexts. You're spinning it telling your team what you want to hear. You're spinning it so that you don't have to provide disclosure of that, the reason why you don't have an expert, because of the unsafe witness and the whole debacle concerning Gareth Jenkins. That's what you're doing. You've disguised all that in this cloying managerial ease, and your general counsel tells you that non-disclosure of all that has been double-checked with the QC and he is fine with it. That's what's happening here. What is the reason and what is the comms line to explain why we're taking forwards fewer of the stacks ca stack cases? Presumably this is genuinely a post office view of lessons learned and or closer to the supportive mutual culture we want in place. If we were to explain it like that, does it then lead to a need for further disclosure regarding past legal cases? Presumably not. Correct and double-checked with Brian Altman. This is how you led, Miss Venels. You led through deception, manipulation, 
and word weaving the reality you wanted in place? That isn't the case, Mr. Henry. I worked in a very straightforward way, and the inquiry has seen so many examples of where I fire questions in a very straightforward way, usually because I don't understand a particular issue, and I, that is what I'm asking here. If you can read this with a very neutral intent of me trying to seek information, that is what I was doing. I didn't work under deception. I was trying to address a culture in the organisation which I had found to be command and control where people couldn't speak their minds and they couldn't speak up. I was trying to encourage people to, to work in that way. I, you, didn't, I did not deal in deception. You did not well, want... Thank you both very much. Thank you. I think that's, uh, 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 that's fine. Thank Good. You, sir. We'll now have our first morning break. And, Mr Henry, you'll be glad to know that there's been great efficiency because I've already been sent a message to the effect that the documents you refer to are now with me. Thank you, sir. I have to thank my learned junior. Well, I'm, I'm thankful to you both. So we'll, um, uh, I, I think by my, um, uh, what, the clock, it's 10.56. So 10 past 11, all right with everyone? Yes, thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us still? Yes, I can. Thank you. I'll just wait for the room to, uh, to settle down as we're about to hear some evidence. Yes, it's Mr. Steen. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Beer. Is there still um, some chatter going on, Mr. Steen, which is preventing you starting? Uh, uh, sir, no, there was a phone that was going off, and I was just caught pausing right. for a moment. All right, that's fine. All right. Uh, Ms. Van Olds, the, the situation here is that you covered up the faults in the Horizon system, didn't you? You papered over the cracks, and you dragged Paul, the post office, into financial profitability over the debris that your firm had made of the lives of sub-postmasters. That's what's happened here, isn't it, Ms. Fennels? I said at the very beginning of giving my evidence that I, there are no words that can express the regret that I feel for what happened to the sub-postmasters. I had an objective, it is right, as the chief executive of the company, to bring it to, to it wasn't profitability, but a, a commercial sustainability so that it consumed less funding and less subsidy from the government. And what the That's evidence has shown us, Ms. Venels, is quite, quite simply this. You didn't actually care about sub-postmasters, mistresses and their employees, did you, Ms. Venels? When I was Chief Executive of the Post Office and before that as Network Director, I spent many hundreds of days uh, and met hundreds if not thousands of sub-postmasters and their staff and I was noted within the organisation for caring about sub-postmasters and one of my huge regrets in this is that I did not do that for the sub-postmasters affected in this way and that will be with me. By the time of your appointment, Ms. Venels, the post office had gone through the network reinvention program in 2001-2004. Now, that had been an attempt to ensure the survival of the post office from the attack by commercial providers to the core business, and also to cope with the fact that there was an increasing take-up of digital banking. Now, that was just before the time you joined. Do you remember being told about the network reinvention program? The network reinvention programme was, was six years before I joined. Yes. I remember the name. That's all I recall. Right. So the answer is yes. By 2006, the next Save the Post Office programme is network change. Now, that went from 2006 to 2009 or 10. Do you remember that one? I do. Right. Now, people that worked in the post office may recall the fact that uh, um, post office staff members wore lanyards the sort of lanyards we have for this inquiry. 
which had forward 5 to 11 on them. Do you remember that? I do. And that was a way of stating that that program, the network change program, was going to be the next attempt to return the post office to profit by the year 2011. Do you recall that? The forward 5 to 11 programme was much wider than network change. That was one work stream of it. Yes. So the answer is, yes, this was the next attempt to try and get the post office back into profitability. Do you agree? Forward 5 to 11, yes, certainly. Right. So by 2010, 2011, we then get to the start of the network transformation programme. Do you recall that one? I do. Now, you should recall that one because by this point, you had been appointed as network director and then later on as the CEO of the post office. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, the network transformation program was the post office's attempt to uh, eliminate sub-postmasters basic pay, in other words, cut out a certain amount of expenditure from the balance sheet, but increase slightly the percentage from post office transactions going to sub-postmasters. Do you agree that that was one of the strategies? That's not entirely correct. It was far more complex than that. I'm not saying it's not complex. I'm saying no, that that but, was but one part of it. Do you agree? That, misre that misrepresents the offers and the impacts on sub-postmasters. Do you agree, Ms. Venels, that the position sorry, in relation... Sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry. I understand. I know it's extremely tempting, and um, Mr. Henry cured himself of it. I don't want the witness being um, spoken to when she's answering, and I don't want the witness answering when you were asking a question, if yes, you see what I mean. So, Let's try uh, it again, Ms. Fennels. Was one part of the network transformation program an attempt to reduce the bill to the post office by trying to get rid of the basic pay to sub-postmasters? That wasn't at all the way it was, the objectives were set, no. I, I can explain the program to you if you wish, but that was not the objective to remove the basic pay from sub-postmasters. There were three different aspects of the pay that was looked at, and some and some postmasters for many years were able to stay on the original contract if they so chose. There were other sub-postmasters in areas of protected postcodes where the contract was never changed and in fact they were given additional subsidy there were then two models of post office that were put in place the mains post office which is the one i think you're referring to where the larger post offices which were alongside significant retail businesses and high had high footfall had the opportunity to grow sales and were paid on a purely um but again it was extremely complex but a commission-based payment the locals model was a combination right we do agree on one thing. Network transformation was a complex program to try and get the post office back into commercial reality. I'm calling it profitability. Do you agree with that? I do. It right. was one of a number of streams. Yes. There were, there were, as Alistair Cameron mentioned in his witness evidence, there was significant job cuts and salary freezes for those who worked for Post Office Limited too the Crown Post Offices and the cash centres were affected. Right. We agree on one thing. This is the latest attempt to get the post office back on the rails. Yes. Yes. Fine. That's all I'm trying to establish, Ms. Vennels. Now, that also included a hard-won and no doubt complex, financial, complex negotiation to ensure that there was a financial package from government of $1.6 billion. That's correct. Yes. Now, as I understand the papers that relate to this, the total that was going to be achieved by way of um, an injection of cash into the post office was going to include another 400 million, taking it up to two billion pounds. Is that about right? I don't recollect the two billion figure, and the subsidy was divided in two parts. One was an ongoing subsidy to keep the post offices going. The other was an investment to try to make the savings and to invest in, for instance, IT. Now, we know that this is ongoing because we can see, if we wish to, that there's the post office transformation uh, documents, the third report of the session of the House of Commons Business and Innovation Skills Committee, a committee that you may recall attending. Now, that was in 2012. 
by the time we get to 2013, the network transformation program was starting to work, wasn't it? It was leading to some improvements in the business viability. Do you agree? I'm not sure I remember that. My recollection of the network transformation program was a very difficult meeting with the minister where we were told that instead of converting 19 post offices a week, we had to get to 50. And I believe that was around 2013. I think it was another couple of years before the impacts were made. Eventually, though, it was successful. By about 2017, the balance sheet was looking better. Essentially, the post office had come into commercial viability. Do you accept that? I think that's probably about right. And that's largely that. how you got your gong, your CBE, by being able to parade the fact that this was your work as a CEO of the post office that led the post office's transformation into commercial viability. That's what you got the gong for, isn't it? I didn't put together the testimonial for the CBE. I never saw what it was recommended for. It was for services to the post offices and, and for charity. I'm sure that was part of it. But the other part of the turnaround of the post office was keeping post offices in communities across the UK. When I joined, and you quite rightly point out, the Network Change Programme, we were closing thousands of post offices, and that was devastating communities. And one of the significant outcomes of network transformation and the whole turnaround program was that post offices became sustainable and, and very few closed. And so the, the UK was better served in that sense. Thank you, Ms. Van Os, for describing uh, your view on what happened. So we do know this, 2013, by that point, we had had all of these different programmes in place to try and rescue the post office. The light, latest one that was the latest attempt with network transformation. So let's just see how we compare that to what actually happened in relation to the Horizon system. On your account, you had been repeatedly assured that the Horizon system was reliable. Do you agree with that? I agree. Right. By 2013, you had learned the bugs did exist within the Horizon system. Is that correct? That's correct. And you had learned the 14 branch issue bug existed. Is that correct? Yes. The 62 branch issue bug existed, otherwise known to the inquiry as mismatch bug? Yes. Yes? And you accept in your statement at paragraph 390, I'm not going to take you to it, that those two bugs were significant. Do you agree? Yes. OK. Later on in 2013, the Falkirk bug was learnt by you in July of 2013, paragraph 421 of your statement. Again, I'm not going to take you to it. Do you agree? I do. So by that point, July of 2013, you'd learnt, contrary to what you'd been told, that three bugs existed in the Horizon system. Is that right? Yes. Now, without getting into any detail, you'd also learnt in the midst of 2013 that the expert used to support prosecution had failed to mention bugs in the system and that thereby disqualified himself of acting in future cases. Is that correct? Yes. Could you say that again? Yes. I, I, yeah. You had learnt by mid-2013 that the expert used to support prosecutions had failed to mention bugs in the system. Yes, I had learned that he had failed to mention those two bugs, I think was my understanding. And, and, and as I said, that when it was explained to me, uh, that the, the explanation was that he had, had not identified the impact of those two bugs on, on the case that, that it was applicable And had to. thereby disqualified himself to act in further cases. You knew that as well, yes? Yes. You, you knew as well in mid-2013 that questions were being asked about remote access in bran to branch accounts. Do you agree? Yes, yes. You had the second site report that again came along mid-2013, correct? Yes. You had learnt something about the fact that Mr Scott, head of security, ex-police officer, who was the person with control over whether people should be prosecuted, had been said to have interfered with the proper record keeping of meetings designed as a hub for Horizon related issues. Do you agree you'd learnt that yes. as well? Yeah. Right. By this point, you'd had serial complainants from the JFSA about investigations, civil actions, and prosecutions. Do you agree? Yes. 
you had letters that were gone through by Mr Beer yesterday from Sud postmasters coming to your own office, complaining about the way they'd been treated. Yes. You had articles in the press from the Computer Weekly magazine and Private Eye and other press outlets. You had that as well, mid-2013. Yes. And you also said in evidence this week on Wednesday in reply to Mr Beer that by 2012, you had learnt for the first time that the post office actually took their own people to court against what you said was your assumption that those matters were prosecuted by the police. So That's you've learnt that in 2012. Is that right? Yes. And so if we tie two points together, by 2012, you had uh, learnt about the fact that the post office actually prosecuted people. By 2013, you had learnt that the fact was the post office actually prosecuted its own people and the expert being used to support those prosecutions was no longer regarded as reliable. Is that right? Yes. You also knew that there was a reputational and potentially financial risk to the post office that had to be discussed with the board arising from possible attempts to reopen past convictions. You had learned about that as well, hadn't you? Yes. Do you agree, when considering this entire collection of information, that your world belief in the horizon sh system had been shaken to the core? As I've explained over the last couple of days and in my statement, I, it, 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 if, it, I'm sure you don't want to go back through those different points, but as, as I've explained previously, my understanding around the bugs is that they had been fixed, that they affected a small number of post offices, that Mr Jenkins had had to be stood down because of that, and that the post office was no longer bringing prosecutions, and that it would look for a, a, an expert witness at a future stage. I was not aware, as I've said a number of times now, that the, the elements around Mr Jenkins had caused the post office to breach its duties as a prosecutor. And, and I accept the, the other matters that you've, you've explained. This was an entire collection of horizon belief shattering facts that were direct attack upon the very basic system that supported the post office. All of these coming one after another, bang, 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 attacking the horizon system. By the end of 2013, you could have been in no doubt, Ms. Venels, that the Horizon system needed investigation, needed inquiry, needed a deep investigation and review. Do you agree, Ms. Venels? Mr. Steen, I wish we had done that. I absolutely wish we had done that. I, I still had confidence in the Horizon system from, as, as the inquiries heard, the fact that it was working for the majority of people. I had not understood, I did not have the detail that I have today, and had I had that, my view would have been very, very different. You've said today that your style was to, um, it was not your style to keep in with people in terms of asking questions. You said to Mr Henry, I fired questions in a very straightforward way. What we don't see, Ms Vanels, is evidence that you fired questions in any way at all at those people that you would expect to be asking questions of. We don't see emails saying, I demand answers, I need them now. What on earth has been going on with this system? We don't see those emails, Ms. Fennells. Why not? I had conversations as the inquiry seen with the chief executive of Fujitsu I spoke frequently with the CIO. She and her predecessor were involved whenever issues came up with the Horizon system. When the letters came in from MPs and members of public raising issues around the Horizon system, the experts were consulted and the answers were taken from them. Questions were asked all of the time. Whether I asked the right questions, whether I was given the right answers, I think is, a, is, is now a matter for the inquiry to look at. And so I which is it, Ms Fennels? I, I agree with the, with the chair, that, um, and I apologise if I've interrupted you, but which is it, Ms Fennels? I'm sorry, which you is... Either, 
which is it, Miss Fennels? You either didn't want to look under the rocks because you didn't dare see what was under there, or you didn't ask the right deep-rooted questions. Which is it, Miss Fennels? Go for one or the other. There's got to be one. I believed that I was asking the right questions. I wasn't an IT expert. I may not have asked the right questions, but I never once held back from asking if I was unsure about something. Perhaps if I didn't have the technical expertise, I wasn't asking the correct questions. But I, and I've said this a number of times, I trusted individuals with whom I worked. I trusted that the audits that we've talked about um, seemed to confirm that the system was working as it should, that there were risks around um, privilege access, that I accept. But at no point did I have any information that would have pointed me to something I knew nothing about. Ms. Fennels, you're not stupid. You studied French, Russian, business as a degree. You then worked for well-known companies in the UK, Whitbread, Ar Argos, others. You rose through the ranks at the post office to become its CEO. You were pushing forward under network transformation. You've been quoted as saying that you want and you see a future of the post office opening up more branches, 30,000 branches in the future. That was you, Miss Vannels, at the time. A vision you were expressing to everyone that asked about what you could see for the future. And yet here, all of these facts were adding up to there being a real problem a really difficult problem to chew over right the way through 2013. You failed, didn't you? You failed to get into this on your account. You failed to ask the right questions. You couldn't be bothered, could you, Ms. Fannels? The risk was too great. Looking under that rock, you're going to find a problem. It's going to devastate the post office, ruin it. And you couldn't let that happen, could you, Ms. Fannels? I loved the post office. I gave it, I, I worked as hard as I possibly could to deliver the best post office for the UK. It would have been wonderful to have 30,000 post office branches. That would have been the best outcome ever, to have had more post offices in more communities. What I failed to do, and I have made this clear previously, is I did not recognize the, and it's been discussed within, across the inquiry, the imbalance of power between the institution and the individual, and I let these people down. I am very aware of that, and we should have had better governance in place. We should have had better data reporting in place that meant that we could see what was happening to individual postmasters and to the system. That was not the case. At no time did I put the post office over the cases that were brought forwards. I worked as hard as I could and to the best of my ability, and I am very sorry that I was not able to find out what the inquiry has found out. I don't know today how much wasn't told to me. I do know information that I didn't get, and I don't know in some cases why it didn't reach me. But my only motivation was for the best for the post office, and for the hundreds of postmasters that I met. And I regret deeply that I let these people down. Ms. Fennels, that's absolute rubbish, isn't it? Under your leadership, with your sidekick, Mrs. Van der Bogart, you took on the glow litigants in the High Court, fighting tooth and nail, allowing counsel on behalf of the post office to cross-examine the litigants on the basis that the losses were their fault due to their incompetence or dishonesty. That's what happened under your leadership. Ms. Fennels, that's what you allowed to happen under your leadership. 
This wasn't thinking, hang on, there might just be a problem with the system. I'd better be careful. This was tooth and nail, fight for the post office, wasn't it, Ms. Fennell? And Mr. Steen, every, my ambition was that every case in that scheme was looked at. And the inquiry has heard, and I was disappointed when, when Angela van den Bogard gave her evidence that she didn't talk more about that. Because one of the, the consistent piece of feedback we had on the investigations in these cases is, and, and the inquiry heard it from Patrick Bork as well, is that they were looked at in every detail, they were re-examined, the system was apparently considered. I don't know um, why it was the case that that the issues that were there were not found in those cases. But that was the ambition at the time. Well, let's have a look at what you said to Mr. Beer in your evidence on the first day, when you said that you feel that there was a lack of governance and that you were too trusting. Now, as we've already discussed, your statement says that you were first aware of the Barg suspense and mismatch in 2013. But also, you explain in your statement you refer to a speaking note, and so for your notes, it is uh, uh, paragraphs 363, 364, that you knew that those bugs were from the period 2010 to 2012. Do you accept that? Uh, yes, I think so. Right. Well, I take you to the relevant paragraph. I, I'll Plain and simply there, you're point. told in a speaking note that these are old bugs, okay? Or old bugs in terms of going back before 2013. And you say in your statement, you'd never been told about bugs, errors, or defects in the system. And you say in your evidence that what you've been told about the Horizon, system, the Horizon system's robustness was wrong. That's what you're saying. Do you agree? Yes. OK. Now, help us understand, from your work within the post office, why was it that the knowledge of the mismatch bug and the way it was dealt with was known to key post office figures, yet that information had not been supplied to either Ms. van der Bogart or yourself until 2013? How did it happen, Ms. Van I understand that the, the situation, that there was managers involved in a meeting looking at the bug. They took a decision on the, the best approach to it, and it stayed within... No, 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 no Ms. Fennell. So that's not the question, is it? How come you weren't told about this until 2013, instead of being told, no problem with the system, Ms. Fennells, it's robust, no bugs in the system? How come you hadn't been told until 2013 that that actually was a lie? not true. There were bugs in the system. You did ask that question, didn't you? Are you saying that you didn't ask that question? Sir, you're on mute. Um, I, I simply intervened to say that you asked her a question, but then asked her a second question before she'd answered the first question. Right, I'll recap. Ms. Venels. 2013, you're told that there's bugs in the system. Previous to that, you've been told no bugs in the system. Yes. Simple as that. Yes. Uh, help us understand. You did ask the question, didn't you, Ms. Fennels? Why haven't I been told this before? I asked the question. Uh, so I cannot remember today what, I, what question I asked, but I'm sure you're right that I would have asked that question. And I imagine the answer that came back was this is a bug that happened in 2010, it was fixed. At the time the bug happened, I don't know where my responsibilities lay. One imagines that the, the issues around the IT were raised to the IT director. My, my, what I did when I was told about the bug was to accept, too readily probably, that um, it had been fixed and the right thing had been done. I'm going to take you to your statement. Uh, these are two paragraphs. I've asked, uh, if possible, that they be lined up side by side on our screen. And these are examples. I'm very grateful. These two paragraphs, paragraphs 129 and paragraph 388, they say roughly the same thing. And there are other paragraphs. I'll deal with those in a moment. Page 129. 
I, do not, I did not know about any of these beds because no one told me about them. As I've mentioned, it was the responsibility of Mike Young, operations director at this time. As network director and a member of the executive team, it is difficult to see how I would have come to know about a bed unless it was communicated to me via the IT function. Paragraph 388. I do not think I ever turned my mind to whether there are any bugs in Horizon, which could include entirely harmless, harmless glitches. <coughs> my understanding until May 2013 was that no bugs had been found in Horizon which could affect branch accounts. I believe that because it was what I'd been told by a series of, IT, of senior IT managers over many years. Now, by July of 2013, you had learned of two bugs. You had then learned yes. about a third bug, the Falkirk bug. So what you've been told by these series of IT managers over the many years of your employment, employment at the <coughs> post office was not true. Now, um, in the simplest of possible terms, you must have decided, well, I need to find out why have I not been told about these bugs. Did you do that, Ms. Vannels? I'm not sure that I understand what... Sorry, say, ask the question again, please. Yes. By 2013, you'd learnt of two bugs, and then yes. a third, yes. the full cut bug, yes. being the third yes. one. Yes? Yes. We can see on the screen that you're saying in your statement that you've been told repeatedly by uh, IT staff members that there were no bugs in the system. So my question is the simple one. You must have asked, why have I not been told about these bugs before? What's going on? Did you? I was, when I, was, when I learned about them in 2013, my priority was to, under, was, was to the post offices to understand that no post offices had suffered any detriment as a, as a result of those bugs. I worked personally on the local suspense bug to make sure that all of the issues related to that were seen through. And I accepted in terms of the payments and mismatch bug and the uh, for, later the forecut bug, the explanations that I was given, that the bugs had been raised, they had been dealt with, um, and I accepted those explanations that were given. Did you ask the question? I, Mr. Why Sine, I cannot, didn't? I cannot you, remember if I asked that question or not. Well, the, the only way to understand your evidence is if you're saying that you care about sub-postmasters, if you say that you care deeply about the system, would be a sensible, intelligent CEO would say, what's been going on? Why did I not get told that there were bugs in the system, that they existed, and that they were the mismatch bug, suspense bug, calendar square, all of that? And in terms of the bug that arose when I was CEO, the local suspense bug, as I said yesterday, I had a conversation with Alwyn Lyons where I said, I want to take leadership on this and I want to demonstrate that we will handle these things properly. However, the, previous, the two previous bugs have been handled was not something for me to deal with. I, needed to, I was reassured that they had been uh, sorted out as they needed to be. And I was now working on the one that was still extant, the local suspense bug. And that was what I was doing. You've said repeatedly. The, the one of them went back to 2006, and I accepted the explanation that that had applied to the legacy horizon system, that it had been fixed. And I, I don't, the trouble is I don't know if I remember now from the documentation I've read in preparation for the inquiry or whether I can remember it from then, but that that hadn't had impact on the cases I think Mr. Castle's case was mentioned in respect to that. And the payments and mismatch bug, I accepted that th the work had been done on that and I was concentrating on what needed to happen to the current one. And as I've also said, that these bugs had no impact on the cases which we were concentrating on or, or about to move into the complaints and mediation scheme. That is what I remember doing. You've said repeatedly that you've been too trusting, that you accepted what people told you. One of the things that you say that you were told was that there were no bugs in the system. 
So let's turn to the other side of this. Who do you blame? Who did you trust too much? Name them, please. I tr I, I've mentioned the names previously. No, the, the, do it the people, again. Tell I'm, us I'm, who you think that you shouldn't have trusted because they let you down. Give us the names, please. I, I will do that, but I'd also like to say that at the time, I trusted the people who gave me the information. So on the IT side, uh, Leslie Sewell and Mike Young, and a, there, there were two other IT directors, but the times we're talking about, it was Mike Young and Leslie Sewell. And on the legal side, the general counsels, Susan Crichton and Chris Ojar, and later Jay McLeod. And those people I had worked with on numbers of other very seriously important projects. They had never let me down. And I, I'm not sure at what stage you start to not trust individuals with, with whom you, you have previously. And I think one of the big mistakes, which I mentioned on day one here, is that we did not have sufficient oversight, particularly around two very technical functions, because there is a risk if you rely on, as I did, and my board colleagues did, and my group executive colleagues, so this isn't just me, we relied on one or two key individuals. And that puts a burden on those individuals. And an organization shouldn't do that. We should have had better scrutiny around the board table in terms of IT and legal. And I thought that I had, particularly on legal, I thought I had the scrutiny from the external legal advisors we were using. And what I've heard through recent evidence to the inquiry may suggest that that wasn't perhaps as good as it should have been. Let's stay with bugs, errors, and defects. You mentioned Mike Young. Yes. Right. Mike Young was referred to in your statement as someone that had told you that there's no difficulty with the system, there are no bugs in the system. By mid-2013, you knew that not to be true. He was someone that hadn't told you the truth. Do you agree? I don't know, uh, in, in terms of the question put in that very black and white way, yes. I don't know what Mike Young did or didn't know. I can only go on what he told me at the time. As of July or the summer of 2013, was Mr. Young still working I, at, at the post office? Thank you, Sir Wynne. I was going to, to mention that. I think he had left by then. Have you had any contact with him since? At all? No. Um, in terms of complete transparency, I think once he was um, an officer in the Para Regiment, and I contacted him once on November the 11th. Uh, and have you had any recent contact with him? No, I don't know what he's doing now. Thank you. No, I, I don't want to be elliptical about this, Mr. Steed. It's just that the inquiry to date has been unable to trace Mr. Young, and so I was seeing if Ms. Reynolds could help us. No, no I, I'm sorry. I understand that, sir. I, I had wondered why he hadn't been um, here. Now, let, let's turn to another matter. The, the contract with sub-postmasters. Now, you know, because you've read the judgments from Mr. Justice Fraser, now Lord Justice Fraser, in the High Court, you know that the contract was discussed in detail in the judgments Yes. that he gave, yes? And you know that the original contract stated that the sub-postmaster is responsible for all losses caused through his or her own negligence, carelessness, or error. That's what it said originally, yes? Uh, yes. Okay. But you're also aware, no doubt, from your own work within the post office and the evidence that we've heard from, this is an example, Miss Harding, an accountant that was called in relation to the impact program and a post office employee, that the interpretation that had been placed upon those, that contractual terms was that they, the sub postmasters, were liable contractually for any shortfalls which had to be made good. You were aware of that? I don't remember that, but I'm happy to accept it. Well, Mr. Yes. Cameron gave evidence about that. He explained that traditionally it had been because. It was because the post office didn't have visibility on what was going on within a post office branch, OK? And so we get the horizon system that, that comes in, and we know that shortfalls are being identified and that sub-postmasters and mistresses are being told to pay up thousands and tens of thousands 
of pounds from their own money. You're aware of all of that? I am, yes? yes. OK. When, before the High Court judgments, did you become aware that the post office treated sub-postmasters and mistresses as liable for all and any shortfalls? Is that the change from, to the network transformation contract? I'll move on to network transformation in a moment and, the court, and what happened to the contract. So my question is, before the High Court judgments, when did you become aware that the situation within the post office was that sub-postmasters were being told to pay up for shortfalls? I believed that was the way the contract was in place from when I joined as network Hi. director. Okay. All right. So you accepted, is this correct, that there was effectively automatic liability for a sub-postmaster for an apparent shortfall identified on the Horizon system of, for example, £20,000? That's what you believed was the situation, and you thought it was fair. Is that right, Ms. Reynolds? I understood... I'm, sure, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. I, I understood the contract that was in place, and I relied on the, the expertise of those dealing with it, dealing with investigations, to come to whatever the correct interpretation was. I never personally had any close involvement with the contract or how that was interpreted or how postmasters were held accountable for it. You, you turn to this all the time, don't you, Ms. Fennells? You always keep a distance between any knowledge that you've got and application of that knowledge. And you say there are all these other people around, this entire group of people within poll, they keep an eye on this, that's their thing. It's their fault for not bringing stuff to you. It's their fault for not telling you the truth. That's what you do repeatedly, Ms. Fennells, isn't it? My question is a simple one. Mr. You were Steen, aware these... that sub-postmasters had to pay up when there was an alleged for shortfall on the Horizon system as an example, for £20,000, sums like that. You were aware of that, weren't you, Ms. Vannels? Mr. Steen, I was the chief executive, and I was trying to run an organisation of 60,000. Answer 60, my question. I, I will come to your question, but you made a statement about why I didn't know things. At the level I was working at, I did not have sight of those sorts of decisions, and nor, would I, nor could it have ever happened. I was running an organisation of 60,000 people. You have to have various layers of management to do that. I regret deeply that some of that information didn't reach me. Um, and I accept what you say, that the post office uh, interpreted the contract and held people accountable, as, as you just suggested. When did it come to your attention? that people were being asked to pay up for very large sums of money that were identified as so-called shortfalls. When, Ms. Vannels? I imagine when we were starting to, or when the the team working on the complaint and mediation scheme were looking at the detail of some of those cases. And it, I knew about Mrs. Misra's case, which was a huge amount of money. Um, I can't remember other examples, but I'm sure there were some. Right. So we've identified that this came to your attention in the way that I've described. This, again, is around 2013. Is that fair? Yes, I would think okay, so. Okay, right. Now, what inquiry did you make, having this being brought to your attention, that the Horizon system blames all shortfalls upon sub-postmasters for large sums of money? What did you do about that? What inquiry did you make about it, Ms. Vennels? I set up the, scheme, the complaint and mediation scheme to look into every single one of those inquiries. See, a reasonable, caring CEO would have said, I want answers. I want to know what's going on. I want to find out about what's happening to these people, the sub-postmasters, that are the lifeblood of the system. And I want to know that 
answer with me now, not set up some distant review. Ms. Fennells, you didn't do that, did you? I think you will find cases where I ask those sorts of questions, but where we were dealing with historic cases, they needed to go through a proper review process. You can't, just as a chief executive, ask somebody for their opinion on something. You have to go into it in a huge amount of detail, which is what I understood was happening. And I regret that we did not deal with those cases as, as <coughs> we should have done. Now, we've mentioned the Network Transformation Programme, and we're going to just have a brief look at the 2013 version of the contract, which is at POL 403872. Can we go, please, to page 12? What were the last three numbers again, Mrs. Steen? Last uh, three numbers are, well, four numbers are 3872. 3872. POL 403872. Thanks very much. And if we can scroll down slightly, we'll see paragraph 4.1. If you can just highlight the 4.1, I'd be very grateful. Right. So we've discussed what the original contract said. The original contract, which said that the sub-postmaster is responsible for all losses caused through his own negligence, carelessness, or error. Okay? So network transformation program coming in in relation to the new contract being put in place, we think the new contract, by 2013. And this contractual term that we're about to look at is repeated in 2014, okay? And so it says this. I'm sorry, could you just say the last point again about the relevance of the two dates? Right, 2013 is the version of the network transformation contract, the new one that came in that time. Thank you. And this is repeated in the 2014 version of it. So right. 2013, 2014, we've now got this contractual term. Paragraph 4.1. The operator shall be fully liable for any loss of or damage to any post office cash and stock, however this occurs, and whether it occurs as a result of any negligence by the operator, its personal or otherwise, or as a result of any breach of the agreement by the operator, except from, for losses arising from the criminal act of a third party other than personnel, which the operator could not have prevented or mitigated by following post office's limited security procedures or by taking reasonable care, okay? So chopping out the legalese, basically this time it says you pay up, fully liable for any loss or damage, no caveat at all, no, nothing being said this time about losses being only responsible being sub postman, sorry, being responsible for all losses caused through his own negligence or carelessness. This time it's straight pay up. Do you accept that? Uh, yes. Okay. So again, by 2013, what you've known about, and we've gone through, the collection of problems in the horizon system, which tell you that there are bugs in the system, tell you that there's a problem with the expert that was called in cases in relation to the system. What the post office does in the teeth of all of that evidence and those issues is it actually tightens the contractual screw, doesn't it, on sub-postmasters. That's what the post office was about. Even in the face of what must have been doubts about the system, the post, offices, the post office decides, let's make damn sure that the post office, post office sub-postmasters and mistresses pay up. You knew about that, didn't you, Ms. Reynolds? I was aware that the network trans... So when we went into network transformation, the contract that had been in place for many, many years had had numerous iterations to it, and the organisation took the opportunity. This was led by the then network director, Kevin Gilliland, and the legal team, and they took the opportunity to, as I understood it, simplify the contract and put something in place that would be more manageable for sub-postmasters. When the network transformation, into, sorry, 
more manageable in terms of what they had had previously was a contract with many, many, many addendums added to it, addenda added to it. Um, this was an opportunity to restate the contract. The contract was signed by, I think, 4,000 new postmasters um, because of the issues that ha had been raised by Second Sight. We made sure that they had copies of the contract and that they had legal advisors to assist them as they went through it. As far as I'm aware, we had no feedback whatsoever uh, about, well, to be fair, the new people coming in would have known this was a change, but there were also existing sub-postmasters who signed for the new contract. I, I understand the point you're making about this tightening it up. I didn't know that at the time. Um, but it was accepted by the, uh, the new and the existing sub-postmasters who had changed to this contract with legal advice. But so I then, completely understand the point you're making. It's under your I leadership, Ms. Venels. It's so it's under your leadership. You were meant to be setting a tone, a tone that should have gone through this organisation, a tone of caring, you've explained. No one could have cared more for sub-postmasters. But under your leadership and your tone, they tightened the contractual screw. It's right, isn't it, Ms. Venels? The contract was... This, this clause was changed. I was not involved in that conversation at all. Um, and it was never presented to me in the way you have. I completely accept that with the issues that there were with the Horizon system, the things that we have since understood, that this absolutely, where things went wrong for postmasters, was a more difficult contract than the one that had been there previously. Although, as you said before, I believe the interpretation of the previous one was more along the lines of what this, this amendment said. I'll take you to another document. It's FUJ402037. FUJ402037. While that's coming up, and yes, sorry to take a minute of your time, Mr. Steen, but you said that this contract was the contract which newcomers to the post office, office uh, as sub-postmasters would uh, conclude. But you also said that existing postmasters, um, so already contractually bound, uh, signed this contract. Now, the question I want to ask is, w was that optional? W were they, in effect, um, cajoled into signing it, or what? What happened? The one, the, the existing postmaster. Yes, I understand, Sir William. Um, it, it was optional, and those... Sub so, so this... I'm sorry? No, pe pe no pe pe people should not shout out from the public gallery, otherwise they'll be removed. The witness should give her evidence without interruption. Thank you, Mr Beer. Thank you. I, I, I tried to explain earlier, this was quite a, a complex program network transformation. There were a number of different options for sub-postmasters. Some chose to stay on the existing contract. Some, in a sense, had no option other than to stay on the existing contract because they were within what were called protected areas. Those, some, some chose to leave the organisation and they took with them um, compensation which was funded by, had been negotiated with the NFSP and was funded by government from this investment subsidy and others chose to take um, an investment which the post office made with them, for them and with them, to convert their existing post offices to what was called a mains or a locals post office and that was when they changed to the mains contract so I don't know, Sir Wynne, the number of post offices in the new mains contract which were existing or new sub-postmasters, but there was a, a mix of the two. That's fine. I just wanted to get a flavour of what occurred. Thank you. And you can add two minutes to your time, Mr. Steen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll try and use them wisely. FUJ... I should have been briefer. <laughs> four zeros, two oh three seven. Thank you. Now... This document is an application support service fourth line service description. Now, that rather entertaining title is, uh, is a document that is dated the 24th of August 2006. So this predates your employment, okay? 
we go to the bottom of uh, the first page, please. And you'll see that this document has I'm got sorry, a proof. Mr. What, what was this document? Could I, you could just yes, tell me go the to title the top again, again, please. Right. What this document is: Application Support Service Fourth Line Service Description. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. So just to make sure, as it says, Fujitsu Services at the top left-hand corner. Just to make sure that this is also known to the post office, we'll go to the bottom of the first page. Thank you. Right. You'll see there, approval authorities, name Dave Hulbert, post office head of systems operations, and Richard uh, Brunskill, Fujitsu Services, okay? Yes. So it's a joint document, Fujitsu and post office, 2006, all right? I'm going to go to page 9, paragraph 2.0. Uh, 7.1 at the bottom of the page. Okay. Now, you've been asked a number of questions by Mr. Beer, which was that the inquiry has been able to find out documents that uh, demonstrate that there were issues within the system. The inquiry has been able to ask the right questions and receive documents describing the issues within the system. Okay? Now, all you needed to do was ask, what do we do about these, these bugs? Look at the bottom of the page, 2.7.1, third line support service. The third line support service works closely with the application support service, fourth line, to provide bug fixes to enable the resolution of software incidents. 2006, Ms. Venels, an entire system that is devoted, four lines of support that are operated by the Fujitsu system, paid for by Paul, trying to get to resolve bug issues. And you didn't ask the question, how do we fix these things? What's the system? Or did you? I asked the question in relation to, as I mentioned earlier, my answer is the same. I asked the question on the local suspense bug because it was still in place, and I accepted what was explained to me which was that this, these, these were, I, I don't think we even had a conversation about the calendar square bug because it was so long ago. The one in 2010, I was told that all the work had been done and had been fixed. I, I completely understand the point you're making. That there, there must have been other people in the post office who knew that this, one of the questions I have asked is that there must have been IT managers, whether as seniors, Dave Hulbert, I don't know, but who knew that this was happening? I heard Mr. Cipriani's evidence where I heard that there was fix upon fix and documentation wasn't in place. I don't understand why the post office or who in the post office knew this. I don't believe any chief executive, let alone network director in a different stream, would understand about the third or fourth line support of an IT system but I'm very disappointed that I didn't and that, that somehow that information wasn't explained in some way. You're doing it again, Ms. Vannels, aren't you? Wasn't explained. You're, you're doing it again, aren't you? You're saying that other people might, it might have been quite nice if they'd explained this to me. You do that as a way of avoiding the problem, which is that at best you didn't ask the question, at worst you knew that the answer would not help the post office. It's what you do, isn't it, Ms. Vannels? You distance yourself time and time again. And you blame these mysterious other people for not telling you the truth. Mr. Steen, the inquiry has seen the number of questions I asked. If I ask questions of senior people in IT or legal around issues that I don't understand or issues I don't know about, if I don't know there is a third line support service providing bug fixes from 2006, I can't ask the question about it. I'm going to turn briefly to whistleblowing policies and how that was dealt with by the post office in 2018 document pol 30030969 okay so this is group policies whistleblowing policy Whole document as I've described, it's a post office document, and the date of this, I hope you'll take it from me, is 2018. 
So it's within the period of time when by you're still at the post office, okay? Yes. All right. Can we go please to page three of 15 and paragraph 1.4, bottom of the page. Now, Ms. Vandals, you, you know the importance to a business of, of whistleblowing policies, don't you? Yes, I do. Yes. It, it, it's, it's important for the culture to have an open and honest discussion between staff members, leadership, and with one another to have a strong whistleblowing policy. Do you agree? I do. Right. And it's important that people are able to find someone within, within an organisation that they can speak to properly and without fear so that they can bring matters to the attention of the leadership. Do you agree? Yes. Right. So again, let's have a think about how that's applied to the sub-postmasters. The 2018, there's something like 11,000 branches still open. Okay? All right. 1.4, application. This policy is applicable to all employees within the group and outlines the protections provided for whistleblowers by law. In order to encourage reporting of wrongdoing, post office will, where appropriate, extend equivalent protection to postmasters, agents, assistants, and members of the public. Now, to your knowledge, first of all, was even this tentative extension of the whistleblowing policy in 2018, the first time that it had been extended to sub-postmasters? I don't recall, I'm afraid. And why does this policy, at 1.4, extend only that protection where appropriate to sub-postmasters, rather than saying, of course, we care about sub-postmasters, they need to have someone that they can speak to. It's an important part of the culture that they're able to identify issues and problems with the system. Why doesn't it just simply say that? I don't know. It's a good question. I've no idea why those words were necessary. Lastly, let's turn to what happened at the High Court again. You're aware, aren't you, that the High Court judge, Mr Justice Fraser, stated in his Rise and Issues judgment in December 2019 that he had gained the distinct impression that the post office is less committed to the speedy resolution of the entire group litigation than, than are the claimants. And Mr Justice Fraser then went on to refer to the extreme nature of costs, which were, even by the experience of a High Court judge, very high, even by the standards of commercial litigation. Do you remember him saying that? I think I may have left the organisation by then, but I will have read it in the judgment. Yeah. You see, he wasn't to know that there would have been a discussion about the approach to the litigation. In September of 2017, poll document POL 406380. POL 406380. Thank you. Paragraph four of the document, bottom half of page two. We can go to paragraph uh, 4.3, actually. Thank you. Right, so this is a Bond Dickinson strategy advice document being considered by the post office under your leadership as CEO. What it says there is, we believe the better solution is to try to focus the claimants into a collective position where they will either abandon the claims or seek a reasonable settlement. It should be remembered that the claims that are financially supported by, by Fries, whose fees are at least partially conditional on winning, a third party funder and insurers. Without support, these proceedings would not have been possible. All three entities will have the power to pull their support if the merits of the case drop below a certain level. Our target audience is therefore Fries, the funder and insurers, who will adopt a cold logical assessment of whether they'll get a payout rather than the claimants who may wish to fight on principle regardless of merits. 2017, the post office set about its strategy of fighting tooth and claw for its own reputational interests over those claimants at the High Court and adopted this strategy as the High Court judge identified.
That happened under your leadership, Nathaniels. All of this did. You set the tone, didn't you, Ms. Fennels? And the tone was, let's eliminate them. Let's get rid of these bugs in our system, the sub-postmasters. That's what you set in place, wasn't it, Ms. Fennels? Is that a question? Because I'd like to yes, answer Yes, the wasn't it, it Mrs. Fennels, was you. the question. I Thank think you. you may have noticed. I, I, I did not set a culture like that. I did not lead the litigation. I remember reading this, well actually I don't know if I saw this particular document because I was not personally involved in the litigation steering committee. There was a board subcommittee of which I was one member. I had two conversations with Jane McLeod and I'm disappointed, I don't know the reason and I'm making no other point then I'm disappointed that she can't come and give evidence to the inquiry uh, because I think it is important that the inquiry understands more around the approach to the, the group litigation. But I had two conversations with Jane that I remember clearly. They weren't documented because a lot of the, organized, the way that you work as a chief executive is you have conversations as you're going between meetings and things. But specifically, I sat down with Jane twice on this to say that I was very uncomfortable that the post office was going through this. The post office didn't call the group litigation. It was set in place by the postmasters, and I understand why, and I'm very pleased that it was so that we've got to where we are today. But it wasn't a policy that I put in place, and the questions I asked of Jane on those two occasions were, this feels completely wrong to me. What can we do? We should not be um, in the process where we are fighting in court with sub-postmasters. And her first response when I asked her the first time was that we ha I think it was that we hadn't got enough information at this stage, but it was very likely that we would try to settle. And the second time that I asked her, um, her view was, and the view of the, the leading counsel that we took, that actually the only way to solve this was to take it through. So I regret hugely the group litigation and I've seen all of the paperwork behind it. And in view of the judgments that were taken and where we are today, it, it, it is unacceptable reading. Thank uh, you, Ms. Steen. No uh, further questions, sir. That, that, that's good. Right, fine. Um, so it's now 12.18 by my um, clock. Uh, so we'll start again at 25 to 1. And then we have a half-hour session, which, is, as I've said, encompasses questions on behalf of the NFSP and Ms. Singer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, good afternoon. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. So we have Ms. Watt on behalf of the NFSP and then Ms. Christy Allen on behalf of Susie Sinclair, Susan Sinclair. Thank you. So, Ms. Watt, would you be kind enough to arrange your questioning so that you finished around about five to one, please? Uh, sorry, sir, around about? Five to one? Yes, uh, thank you, I will. Uh, Ms. Venos, I appear for the NFSP, uh, just by way of explanation. The NFSP uh, of today is a core participant at this inquiry has provided hundreds of documents to the inquiry to help understand what was being said and done during the Horizon scandal. Yesterday, you were shown what the NFSP uh, today finds, and likely many others found, a shocking and deplorable email sent by the former General Secretary of the time, George Thompson. Now, Mr. Thompson will have to come to this inquiry in a few weeks' time and answer for the things he said and did. But there were a couple of points in Mr. Beer's questions of yesterday which I wanted to ask you about first. Of course. You were asked by Mr. Beer who paid the NFSP's bills. You remember that? Yes. And you couldn't quite recall the situation at the time of the email, which was December 2012. Right. So just thinking about that a bit more uh, to see uh, if uh, you can help. I think you would have been aware... Uh, that the NFSP was a trade union until 2014? Thank you. I knew that it had changed status at some stage. 
Um, uh, you may have been aware the trade union status was removed by the certification officer because its members were actually self-employed rather than employees. Uh, were you aware of that? I don't think so, no. Uh, I think you would have been aware that the grant funding agreement, which you and Mr Thompson were both, both involved in bringing about, was signed in 2016. Do you recall that? Thank you. And I think you would have been aware that came after a membership vote of the NFSP members at its annual conference, when members were offered the options of a merger with the National Federation of Retail News Agents, a merger with the CWU, or the grant funding agreement, and they voted for the grant funding agreement. Do you remember that? I don't remember that, no, but I'll take your word for it. Okay. In the email we saw yesterday, Mr. Thompson made re reference to Horizon being robust. We particularly want to look at that word. Now, that's a word this inquiry has seen, I have to say, peddled by everyone uh, who has arrived from the post office to give evidence. Horizon is robust. It was not just a line, it was a mantra. And it was repeated again and again over years and years until it became the corporate truth. And that was in a business run and overseen by you. And the NFSP, along with everyone else, were fed that line for years too. And actually, what we saw was Mr. Thompson repeating that post office line, post office lie, back to you, wasn't it? I think, as I explained yesterday, I and many colleagues in the post office took comfort from the fact that senior officials in the NFSP were saying that kind of thing. We see many examples of where words are picked up uh, across time. Um, I don't know where robust came from originally. It was certain, you're quite right, used very regularly within the post office, and we saw an example yesterday by the NFSP. But as I said yesterday, from the post office's point of view, we took it as very um, genuine, useful experience that the NFSP made up, as you know, of, of people who ran post offices on a daily basis, found the system to be robust. And, and I don't know how well you know Mr. Thompson or not, but he wasn't somebody who minced his words. And if he thought that was not the case, I don't imagine for one moment that he would have said that. But you would accept that the word robust has its origins in the post office? I don't know. I, I, I imagine so, but I, I really don't know. Uh, just moving on, uh, you were network director and a member of the senior management team, then CEO of the post office uh, during the period of the Horizon prosecutions. And wrapping up everything uh, that's been heard uh, here over the last few days, I'm going to make some suggestions to you. And you can agree with me or not at the end of each one. I won't ask it as a question. I'll put it to you and you can tell me whether you agree or not or accept Thank it you. or not. That you took decisions not to look into things further to avoid finding out how bad things were. I did not. That you presided over a culture where issues did not come before the board if you did not want them to. Absolutely not. That you presided over a culture which meant everyone below and reporting to you across all areas of the business thought about post office <coughs> reputation first before everything else? No. That you presided over a culture which saw sub postmasters as subordinate to all of the business's interests despite their actual partnership with the post office, their financial stake in the business, a stake which provided profits to the post office? No, and that personally, absolutely not that you presided over a culture which had as its priority a requirement to ensure that the message, nothing is wrong, everything is fine, horizon is robust, and that led to MPs, government ministers, the media, the NFSP, the CWU, the courts, many others, being told for years and years that horizon was robust when that wasn't true. I'm sorry, that w could you, you shorten over the that question? <laughs> you presided over a culture that, that allowed that to happen. I, I'm sorry, the statement was too long for me to recall. I'm really sorry, would you mind? I'll Split it, it into two sentences if you can. Yeah. Or... That you presided over a culture which has as its priority a requirement to ensure that the message was nothing is wrong, everything is fine, horizon is robust. Everyone was told that. Uh, that's not the case. 
I, I'm sorry, but th there is a qualification to that, that clearly for the people affected by this, that was absolutely the case, but that was not a culture. That you presided over a culture in which to maintain that aura of nothing is wrong and everything is fine, you needed to surround yourself with a variety of suitable people, handy defensive people who would make sure no dirty laundry landed on the post office doorstep, such as Angela Vanden Bogard, disposable professionals such as Susan Crichton, who could be blamed for anything that was going wrong. Do you accept you presided over that culture? No, absolutely not. Looking at your witness statement, I'm not going to call it up just for, for speed, um, but at paragraphs 14 to 18, uh, you outline the roles you held at the time, and I, I've mentioned that. But across a period from 2007 to 2019, uh, you had those various roles. And we've heard evidence throughout the inquiry that the culture within the investigation and audit branches was aggressive, that sub-postmasters were guilty rather than innocent from the outset, terminology and in investigations uh, used offender reports. Do you accept that was a culture inbuilt across all levels of management which you oversaw? No, uh, and I think it's important I add a clarification to that as well. The, when I became <coughs> chief executive, we fairly soon afterwards stopped prosecutions and the size of that team and the approach of that team um, was discussed and it was changed substantially. Most of those allegations that you have heard, uh, and I'm not at all challenging them in terms of the way they came across the people who made them, um, were from earlier. Um, I want to uh, look at the franchising of Crown Post Offices when you were network director. Uh, you talk about that at paragraph 25 of your statement, just right. for reference. So whereas the NFSP had a sub-postmaster membership, the Crown Offices had a trade union membership. Uh, so you would have dealt with unions such as the CWU when overseeing the franchising of Crown Post Offices. Would that be correct? Yes, that's correct. And it would have been important to you to have had union buy-in for the continuation of Horizon. I'm sorry, as I'm not sure I understand the question or the sequence. As, as, as part of the overall um, work that you did with, uh, with the unions and uh, the franchising, it would have been important for uh, the unions to remain bought into Horizon as the system. It was very difficult to get the unions to buy into anything. Um, I don't recall any conversations with either the CWU or the CMA would have been the other one about them buying into Horizon. You wouldn't have wanted them to start a dispute about Horizon, for instance, would you? Th there was no way I had any influence over whether those unions started disputes or not. <coughs> I think it's correct to say, isn't it, that the NFSP, the CWU and also the Royal Mail Group had facilities and offices within uh, the post office main building for them to conduct business with the post office. We've heard some evidence of that. Is that something you remember? I think it may have been the case with Royal Mail, but not, not with the post office. Um, have you any idea what the value of those facilities uh, that were offered came to? No. Some final questions on network transformation. Um, at paragraph 144A of your witness statement, you uh, say the network transformation programme was designed to increase footfall and share costs between the sub-post office and the re associated retail space. And you mentioned in evidence to Mr Steen there about network transformation uh, you felt being about sustainable businesses, I think. I yes. Think said. yes. So I just want to ask a little more about that. <laughs> By sharing costs between the sub-post office and the associated retail space, do you mean that the post office wanted the sub-postmaster's retail business to bear more of the costs of running the branch? No, what happened is that in the mains post offices particularly, they were, um, they, they were shops, usually fairly successful retail outlets. The advantage of having a post office alongside those shops is that the post office brought with it a very, very high footfall, and then the retail owner, the sub-postmaster, if you like, benefited from in increased sales through their retail outlet from the footfall of the post office. That was primarily the model for the mains post office. For the locals post office, the 
the postmaster always paid their staff. They were their, they were their costs. And in the locals' post office, what we did to a greater extent successfully is we put a till alongside the retail till. And it still happens today in, in a couple of my local <coughs> post offices. You see the staff who work on the retail side working also at the post office counter, which meant that the sub-postmaster was able to reduce their overall staffing bills. Because if you're in a small shop and the footfall is less, what had to happen previously is you had to pay for two separate members of staff because they were two very separate and, and, and counters that were apart. Uh, would you agree that the network transformation programme actually had the effect of reducing the cost of the post office to the taxpayer by reducing the income to sub-postmasters and passing the cost of providing post office services to the retailer? No, I, 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 it's a very good question. What, what actually happened, um, and m much business modelling was done, business plans were produced by sub-postmasters as well before they took on either of these models. What happened at the same time uh, is that the government particularly reduced its business through post offices. And over this time, government business, which paid for sub paid the sales through... Sorry, let me make that clearer. If people came to post offices to take up pensions, benefits, process passports, DVLA, that sort of thing. They were all government business, and postmasters were paid in different ways per transaction for those. When that business was reduced dramatically, as it was, because government moved to a digital by default policy, so it wanted everybody getting pensions and benefits to have them paid directly into a bank account, rightly, actually, and it facilitated that. What it meant was that postmasters lost, and the post office, lost money because that income simply no longer came through the post office. Um, would you accept that the network transformation programme actually ended up being to the detriment of sub-postmasters? I don't believe so. And the programme was done for both postmasters and communities. We did research when the programme was put in place initially and then every year since. And I won't have remembered these figures correctly, but I think the satisfaction levels were high and a figure of around 80% comes to mind. Uh, thank you, Ms. Venos. Those are my questions, and I think the chair will be happy to find I'm slightly early. Thank you. I'm very grateful for your economy of words, Ms. Right. Um, on behalf of Ms. Sinclair, please. Good afternoon, Ms. Venels. I'll stand up so that you can oh, see me, um, but you. I'll sit to do my questions. My name is Christy Allen, and I represent core participant Susan Sinclair, who was a wrongfully convicted sub-postmistress. She was the first to successfully appeal her conviction in Scotland, which only happened as recently as September last year. In your witness statement, you state that you were always open to the real possibility of unsafe convictions and as such, you always sought to be questioning in your approach. After reading accounts of sub-postmasters and reconciling these with the findings of Second Sight's interim report, the identification of bugs with Horizon, and the revelations as to Gareth Jenkins in 2013, to what extent, therefore, did you question the safety of convictions, including those in Scotland? The, all of the sub-postmasters who raised cases um, were admitted into the scheme if, if, if their applications were considered um, that, that there was a case to do that. There was no, there was no means, that there was no intention to exclude anybody. So my understanding, and I'm very sorry because I, didn't, I wouldn't have known the individual cases if there were Scottish cases in those numbers. <coughs> I am very sorry that it took so long for that to be resolved. Thank you. Were you reassured that there was an extra layer of protection in Scottish prosecutions due to the role of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service as the independent prosecutor? I don't think I, well, I had no knowledge of that and I don't believe I asked enough questions there is some documentation that shows that it was a matter that was covered, I think, at a board meeting, um, but it was not covered 
with any degree of frequency, I would, not I would have had to, I had to rely on the legal advisors within the post office and the external advisors as to how that should be dealt with. I have seen, both from inquiry documentation and from witness evidence, um, that that was not, this is difficult for me to comment on because I, I, I don't understand the legal aspects of it, but I heard the evidence from um, Cartwright King and it seems to me that that was not handled as well as it could have been. To follow up, was, was Crown Office not, however, reliant on correct information being timelessly disclosed by the Post Office and indeed by you as CEO, including any new revelations in respect of emerging concerns with Horizon evidence? I had no dealings at all with Crown Office. I'm sorry. But, but I'm sorry, I, I, I had no dealings with Crown Office because I shouldn't have had dealings with Crown Office. Un understood. Um, but would, would you accept that Crown Office was reliant on Post Office uh, providing the relevant information um, timelessly? Um, in, uh, I, that I don't know. I know that Cartwright King were involved. It may be that they were reliant on Cartwright King. Um, there will be other people who would answer that question better than I can for you. Yeah, of course, the point um, being that there was certain knowledge in, in 2013 um, that, that wasn't disclosed timelessly to, to the At the, the post office. office, I accept, yes. And how do you reconcile that, um, despite your knowledge of issues with the reliability of Horizon evidence, criminal prosecutions based on such evidence continued in Scotland up until 2015? My understanding, and there is documentation that says this, was that all um, prosecutions after 2012 were, only cont were not continued based, reliably, based solely on Horizon evidence. I have also learned that in Scotland there was a greater degree of scrutiny of that because um, a second area of evidence was, of corroboration was required as well. But I'm afraid my knowledge of the legal system in Scotland is, uh, is not sufficient to be able to answer any more than that. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we, we have since learned um, from the Crown Office that they've identified so far four cases um, since the Crown Office meeting in 2013 um, with the Post Office that, that relied on um, Horizon evidence. Um, my final question to you, Ms Fennells, is how have you received the statements made by the Lord Advocate to the Scottish Parliament last week that due to this scandal, the Post Office is no longer trusted and as such has been stripped of its role as a specialist reporting agency in Scotland? I'm sorry, uh, there was a cough. I missed the beginning of your question. I, I said, how have you... I'll, I'll repeat the full question. Thank you. Thank you. How have you received the statement made by the Lord Advocate to the Scottish Parliament last week that due to this scandal, the Post Office is no longer trusted and as such has been stripped of its role as a specialist reporting agency in Scotland? I think that's a very appropriate response. Thank you, Ms Fennells. That's all. Thank you, uh, Ms Christy Allen. Um, so that concludes the morning session. Um, We'll, I think, begin again at 2 o'clock, uh, Mr Beer, unless you suggest otherwise. We have Mr Maloney and the potential, but not necessarily the actuality of further questioning after that. Is no. that it? Yes, sir. A full hour on Friday. Very welcome. We, we know that Mr Maloney is punctilious with his timekeeping. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, then, 2 o'clock. Thank you, sir.